yeah. is the 11th. Yes. March 11, 2019, <clears throat> call to order at uh, 635. Our first appointment is at 6.30, it's a joint, again, it's a joint meeting with the uh, Sunderland Finance Committee, and we have gonna, we're going to have a budget presentation, FY20 budget presentation, from the Sunderland Elementary School and Frontier. Do you want to do Frontier or Elementary School first? Good news first? Yeah, I was going to say do Frontier first, that'll be quicker. We can always flip a coin. <laughs> Um, are you putting anything up on the uh, screen? No. Okay. Uh, you want to start with Frontier? Sure. Frontier it is. Can you those out? Hey, with me tonight, I have uh, Dr. Judy Poole, for those who don't know. Um, he's our representative from TMS, which is a um, business Thanks, School business firm that um, we employed this year to help us with um, business management position. So, you will help us walk through the budget. And uh, as soon as everybody gets a copy, we'll. This is the same one. Yeah. Um, this is the one that uh, was voted by Frontier. It's the same one that was given out the other night. Okay. Frontier voted for yeah. Okay. Yeah. Their coffee looks a little easier on the eyes. <laughs> So you, you guys are way too used to sitting these up for 16-year-old eyes instead of 50-something-year-old eyes, huh? <laughs> I didn't have them before this job. Right, right, exactly. The principal didn't need these. Can I get glasses? But they get to this page, yeah. <laughs> I used to be able to read that. Um, so we'll start on page two, which is sort of a 30,000-foot view of uh, the Frontier budget. Um, and you can see salary increases both for um, collective bargaining. Um, and we have some steps that uh, teachers will move on um, based on experience, a projected adjustment to cost of living um, that is still up in negotiations, so that has not been settled just yet. Um, and then um, move some school choice and circuit breaker um, offsets back into the local budget to relieve some stress on those revolving accounts. And we eliminated a special education teacher at Frontier Regional, so um, that brought that in at a 0.79% increase. Um, Non-union increases, this is um, just some projected increases, cost share, 12-month uh, employees that will be working 262 days versus 260. Next year is kind of a weird year between uh, leap year day and then that causing an extra Monday right. along the way. So that's um, the thing there. Uh, administrative um, looks big, but we'll talk about how it isn't so big when we get to the uh, expenditure side. Um, the biggest thing is putting the full-time business manager back into the budget. All of the budgets were adjusted um, when the former business manager left and TMS came on. So TMS, the funds were transferred into a line for contracted services. So um, obviously, uh, with the district going back to a full-time business manager, that then puts all that money back into the, into the salary line. So that's why that looks as big as it is. Um, so the total projected salary changes are $119,270, or a 1.96% increase as we know it right now. On the operational side, um, again, second line down, finance and administrative services. You can see the decrease because the TMS contract will end on um, July 31st of uh, 2019. There will be a month overlap between us and whoever um, the <coughs> district hires for that. Um, other things, there are um, some increases that look bigger than they are because the original budget line um, really was not all that big in the first place. Um, transportation is the big uh, number here at Frontier. Um, that there was an increase um, when we opened the bids uh, in the cost per bus. So it added $185,924 to the Frontier budget. Some other reductions and whatever you get down to the very bottom. And what the budget represents is a $417,961 increase or 3.78%. The next page is the uh, cherry sheet, so you can see sort of uh, where we are with House 1 at this particular point in time. Um, 
Again, um, you'll notice that regional school transportation, that the governor's proposal is significantly less for regional transportation than it was uh, last year at this time. We're still waiting on House 2, which is the House's version of the budget, which will probably be sometime next month. Um, and then the Senate will do their thing in May, and then everybody will try to get together and figure it all out. There's a lot of um, movement right now with regard to the change in the foundation budget foundation formula for the budget at the state level. There are three bills that are currently in place. The governor's plan represents a seven-year phase in of um, the revised formula. Uh, there's a couple of bills in the House and one in the Senate that may try to accelerate that timeline. So where this all lands when it's all said and done, um, you know, nobody really knows at this point in time. So if I could interrupt you, sure. on, on transportation costs, what, what's uh -huh. the total reimbursement percentage from the state? That fluctuates from year to year. That's at the but right, but right now, what, what did the governor put in? Uh, the governor put in 103597 mm. That's down from, uh, excuse me, I just looked at the wrong line, sorry, 99343 and that's down from $179,603 last year at this time. So uh, that's also one of those numbers that is subject to 9C cuts mm -hmm. mid-year as well. So it, it fluctuates pretty wildly from year to year. And, and just just to, to <coughs> state what we know may not some other people may not in, mm -hmm. on TV is that the state to try to make put incentives for regionalization um, had made a guarantee to the communities that that regionalized that there'd be a hundred percent reimbursement and I think last year was like 23 percent came out of the government you know mm -hmm. so a governor was last year was going to fund at 23 percent out of that a hundred percent um and what what does it affect of course it doesn't affect the schools in boston and newton and Methuen and towns like that it affects us in the rural areas exactly. predominantly exactly it has never been funded at 100 percent in 25 years of reform in the foundation formula as i know it so um, so i i would i would tell people if you're watching on tv friends and family that they need to talk to their our new state senator and our and they're well aware of it. Mm -hmm. But just tell you to understand what's happening also because yeah. those those that money that pays for transportation gets taken out of the classroom. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank so that's you. What's happened. Um, so the next page just kind of shows um, the school choice uh, <coughs> receiving. So there are 172 uh, students who are currently for this fiscal year on the roster uh, as coming into Frontier. Uh, there are 40 students that are being sent out to other towns. And then there are charter school, 52 uh, students that are going to um, charter school um, placements. And uh, mostly Four Rivers, um, Pioneer Valley Performing Arts are the two big ones and a few at the Chinese Immersion School. Um, the next several pages are the line-by-line -line budget, so that you can see in detail. The way uh, TMS does our budgets is we use a process called the All Funds Budget, so that we try to lay out what all of the costs are and then show where things are offset by other funds. Um, for your purposes in looking at comparing FY19 to FY20, you want to look at the two blue columns, but the pink column just kind of shows um, you know the fullness of it so for example if you go to page seven um, you'll see that for um, special education teachers you'll see that um, the real cost of those teachers is three hundred seventy nine thousand two hundred forty one dollars but uh, fifty nine thousand three sixty eight is um, offset by circuit breaker and eighty two thousand one ninety three is offset by a special education grant so the actual cost cost to the district at the local level is two thirty seven six eighty um, so just you know, kind of gives you sort of a bigger picture of uh, where uh, funds are used to help offset the actual costs of personnel in the district and you'll see that later on in um, you know Looking down at the educational support uh, nursing staff, you'll see an offset there. You'll see some offsets in classroom assistance on page eight. Um, so that again, that pink 
cost, it shows you the actual salary cost, but the actual cost to the Frontier local budget is in that right-hand blue column and the offsets around it. So that kind of just gives you a sense of where all the particular um, funding sources play into offsetting um, the cost and uh, certainly lessening the impact uh, on, on the district. Do, if I could ask you, do you, uh, is there, I I'm, I'm apologize that we're working at this and you guys are listening. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, does, do you have any handouts that they could pass around if they, people may want to look at those? A few copies. Thank you. So again, you can see the bottom line on page 14 um, shows that the actual frontier budget um, for this fiscal year is eleven million forty-eight dollars, forty-eight thousand four hundred fifty-four dollars, and that the um, voted budget by the school committee is eleven million four hundred sixty-six thousand four hundred fifteen dollars. If you look way over to the right, you can see that 417,961 and the 3.78% that you saw on the, um, the small sheet. So, uh, the next section is around the assessment data. Um, and on page 16, you can see. So, that's page 15. If you guys want to keep up, it's on page 15. So on page 16, you can see the enrollment numbers and um, how that all looks um, across the board. I won't bore everybody by reading that uh, completely. Um, page 17, you can see that um, the assessment to the towns and what the variance is um, from the prior year, what the um, Chapter 70 number will be. Um, the uh, E and D excess and deficiency. The amount that's looking to be applied to um, the budget is two hundred thousand dollars, and then you can see the regional transportation um, offset in there as well. Uh, the bottom of page seventeen shows the minimum contribution comparisons from year to year, um, and as you can see, Sunderland is um, up a little bit by uh, forty-eight thousand um, dollars. Page 18 um, also shows sort of the foundation enrollment and the minimum uh, required contribution. Page 19 short, so shows you um, the differences between FY19 and FY20 in terms of the operating budget and how that would be assessed out to um, the various towns. Sunderland assessment, um, you'll notice that um, it's up $4,953 or 0.28%. Yeah. And then if you look at the transportation piece, you can see that with the general fund budget, you can see again that 3.78. So that's the gross operating budget with all all included. Pages 20, um, page 20 shows again um, how the budget kind of lays out with regard to um, net um, contributions across the board. Again, those are driven by the state, those numbers. The assessments would be that's uh, in section C. So again, Sunderland's um, represents about 23% of the budget. And then the last page um, shows the transportation. Uh, transportation is $432,000 and $99,343 is what um, the state or the governor's budget shows as reimbursement for that. So it's right uh, 
um, it's right within that, that same number that we saw last year. And that's pretty much the lay of the land. As you said, good news. <laughs> Why are you going back to a um, uh, employee as the business manager instead of staying with the contract for services? Um, basically, the the model that TMS uses is that they're not on site um, the entire time. They do a lot of remote work on multiple schools. Um, I, I I value having someone on site um, to work on this, you know, work on the whole budget process. Um, in that manner so we're really missing an administrator in the building um, for day-to-day -day financial issues and so I'm trying to go back to that the traditional model there and so we're currently in the interview process of that with uh, members of the school committee and, and, the, and of the central office staff and having someone on staff is more expensive than the contracting services yes it is because we're paying for benefits and that comes out of the frontier Correct. central office expense Scott, Dave, you have any questions? I'm just looking at there's a little bit of a bump in the testing and assessment. What drove that this time around? Yes, that one's up 23 <clears> percent. <throat> what page are you on, Dave? Uh, just going off the summary on yeah. page two. Uh, the site from there was. That's uh, for software licensing for uh, various testing um, things that get used for students. Is there an increase in tests given or just an increase in licensing fees for the software or? Yeah, um, hmm. yeah. this fiscal year it's budgeted at $2,223. Next year we're talking $2,500. Okay. <clears throat> the school bus contract, that went up substantially, I noticed. Mm -hmm. Is that still a local vendor? Is that from outside yes. of the region? That's yes. correct. Okay. So, so not a question about the specific budget, but what what do you see happening in the next one, three, and five years out for for the regional budget? I mean, is, I, I I mean, is it staying? And, and <clears throat> why I ask is that Sunland, I think, is one of the few communities that actually has increasing uh, populations um, and, and uh, secondary school education right now. I, I was just trying to, you know, get a handle what's going to be happening the next, you know, th three years, five years. Are, 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 you, are you still going to, are you looking at numbers that are staying consistent at, at these present numbers? Um, are they falling? Are they increasing? What, what are you looking at to school population? And, and how do you handle that? I mean, are, are we adding teachers programs? To, and, I, and, and to me, it's, it's again, just by looking at the, the charter schools and, the, and school choice, looks like you guys are doing a wonderful job attracting and, 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 and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to say what I do. I, I hate school choice because I think we, t we take uh, our students and and put dollar signs in this assigned dollar signs to them and not what we should be teaching them so I I've, I've been going way back um, I, I hate the idea of putting attaching dollar signs to students but, but I also look at charter school and that school choice and I don't I don't think it treats any district fairly but what are, what are the numbers telling you I guess what I'm asking. So it, it's difficult to project ahead because of, <clears throat> so the NESDIC numbers that we get out, so we do it, the NESDIC survey basically tries to get us, you know, enrollment trends, you know, shows us, um, you know, pretty steady moving forward. Um, you know, there's an increase 
Sunderland's tough to guess. You have, you have populations, ups and downs, and, and um, with some transient population. We've had a slight uptick from Conway, but then you're, you're talking about numbers versus percentages, that gets all over the place as well. Um, the hard part is, is you're, you're in that constant game of, doesn't matter what our enrollment is, it depends on the matter, you know, it doesn't matter the number of students we have, it matters on enrollment. So where are those students going? Do you have trends of choice out? Do you have trends of charter? And then, um, and so forth. So it's, it's balancing those off. You know, you know, I would say we don't have a clear projection moving, you know, moving ahead right now. Um, so, in the so sense that we can see where our incoming classes are from Frontier yep. and, and that kind of thing, so we can see what the, the elementary schools are giving us. Right. Which the next three years, I would say, is static. There is a there's a dip in the middle, <clears throat> um, primarily due to a, an enrollment change in Deerfield, where they went to a two classrooms instead of three in one particular year. We're going to see that dip in how we handle that, carrying that through, will be a challenge that we see moving forward again in the Frontier lens. Um, so outside of that, I think it's pretty steady with the next five years enrollment-wise. So, so if you, have, when you look when you look at the education that's presented now, what what the kids are going to need to to succeed, what would you change? Are there are there things that you would change right now? And and does that mean does that mean additional monies, or does that mean we're changing changing how how we allocate those resources? Um. I mean, that's, a, that's a really loaded question when you start talking about visionary and within I think right now the the program at Frontier is solid um, and I would say it's a, ahead of the curve compared to um, many area public schools and what we provide both through um, the curriculum for a small school the amount of options that we do um, from um, from the high level to the low level um, for those you know with special needs from um, the AP courses um, we also have a, a variety of what other kids can take from online classes. We're trying to trying to meet all needs um, within a small school. So I think we do a fine job with that. Um, areas I project that we're going to have problems in the future is that we do need to get this capital plan moving forward because if we're having facilities that are now catching up um, with programming. Um, you know, we need to update our library. We need to update um, some of the other facility issues that we have. Um, and so keeping ahead of those kind of things moving forward. Uh, but I think, you know, within our curriculum, I think we're, we're, we're spot on where we need to be. Um, we need to keep looking ahead to what's, what's coming down, but I think we're where we need to be, if that kind of answers you. I, I don't know what you're looking for. You know, if someone was to give me millions of dollars, what would you do with it? You know, if you're talking about, in the sense of, you know, when you're projecting ahead for programming, um, outside of, I think, you know, we, you always throw the word technology. What can we do differently with it? You know, recently we've gone to a one-to-one, -one, um, or one-to-one -one at Frontier, you know, expanding beyond the Chromebook. I mean, we talk about technology. So I, mean, I think I think Chromebook is now just a basic tool. It's not something that's technology-driven. We don't have a, a technology lab in STEM and that kind of stuff where, you know, you can push courses in that direction, but it takes a lot of money. Um, and I think within, where we are with an operating budget, we're putting out a darn good project, a darn good product. <clears throat> You're looking at our percentage right now of two and four year kids going accepted to two and four year colleges at 87%. I mean, you can't ask for your public school to do um, much higher than that. So, you know, we're, you know, college prep curriculum and, and delivering that. So. Okay. I, 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 know, I know in the past we, we've had discussions about. Uh, sometimes um, it, it's nice to see where where the kids not only where they go to school but where they get accepted mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes and sometimes people we don't we don't okay. see where the kids are being accepted and sometimes there's things that you know right now you go to look at a community college I mean it's if I was going to school right now I could go to a community college for two years for no charge Basically, I mean, you, you get or, or at a reduced charge versus paying sixty thousand dollars. I don't think I would hesitate going to the community colleges today. Mm -hmm. So, but we, so you have to, you know, we, we understand. But but I was just wondering how, you know, I, I think it's always wise to go back and, and reassess where you where you are and where you want to go, mm -hmm. and, and look, sometimes looking at the school choice and the and the uh, uh, charter schools. Why? Why are the kids going to different schools? Is is kind of important to know why. You know, what are they getting someplace else that they're not getting at the frontier? And we do look at that. Um, 
<coughs> informal. Um, we have a lot of conversations happening. Well, certainly now there's been a changeover, you know, now here at Frontier, but at when I was principal, you know, just last year, I'd have conversations with each principal um, about the sixth grade class moving to seventh grade, why students were not um, attending Frontier and getting kind of the background on, on those things. Mm -hmm. um, there's been talk, and we're here from every, are we reaching out to each family and, and asking why? Um, we haven't gone so far as that. Um, when we have in the past, not so distant past, that the response rate was very low or the information that was given was very vague. Um, so, you know, that balance out, you know, that's kind of where we're at with, you know, finding that question. Sometimes choice is about convenience for parents. Um, sometimes a, a child has a bad experience in a school. I mean, it, it happens in every school. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, sometimes that, that kind of thing where they're, they're chasing something, they're chasing an image that's different than what the, the school is providing. Because um, I would say some of that is that because the, the quality of academics is, um, I don't believe, is better in any of the charter schools around us. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Hi, Pitch. Hey. I have a question for uh, how many AP classes uh, are offered at uh, Frontier these days? How many? AP? We've since expanded it um, <laughs> since your daughter went through. Um, but the, uh, right now there's 11 AP courses offering with the, an increase in, last year we introduced a capstone project, um, which allows a AP research, um, an AP seminar, which is a two-year program from junior and senior year. It also allows you to apply for an AP diploma after completing both courses. So now you can graduate Frontier with an AP diploma, and that's kind of the, um, that's going, the AP is competitive to the IB diploma mm -hmm. that you see advertised out there. Mm -hmm. So. Nice. My other question is this. Um, some parents may have a hard time paying for these AP classes. What do we have in place to help them, to help these kids? So <clears throat> students who take an AP course, what he's re referring to, are required to take the AP exam. No student is kept out of it. We provide full financial scholarship to those students who can't afford the AP exam. Um, and it, it's based on free and reduced lunch. And so anybody outside of that can make a request to the principal if they can't afford the exam. But we're not going to deny um, any access to an AP course based on cost. So, and the AP thing, we do rotate sciences, so the number is actually higher in the amount of AP courses we offer because we offer one life AP course, science a year, year biology, um, biology or uh, environmental science, they rotate so that um, so they can offer one every other year. Then we do physics and chemistry the other two years. So that we can offer more. Again, we talk about <coughs> offering as much as we can um, to students going through. I notice some towns have higher number of uh, school choice <coughs> kids coming in than going out, you know. Yeah. Do you see that a continuation from the elementary schools? If their school choice in the elementary school from certain towns, they continue that right up through the, the high school? Right, you know, so Frontier, you know, we talk about school choice. Frontier's a, a winner in the school choice game when you look at those numbers, yeah, 172 yeah, oh, coming yeah. in. Um, the large percentage of those are coming up from the elementary schools. So you take in each one of the towns, you know, adding up, you know, the number that they're adding, and then we add on um, as well in middle school. But the numbers that we're taking in in seventh grade and ninth grade, is 10 and under. Um, okay, now, and every now and then we'll have a spike year a little bit more, but so the majority of those kids are coming up from the elementary schools. And the schools. total school population is around 600 with the school choice, Six, school out, charter school out, and the, and the regular resident population? The combined yes, population right. at Frontier is 643 or something like that, so it's around, it's around about six and a half, so just in that area. So it's up slightly from last year. We have more school choice last year than this year, than the year prior. Um, and some of that has to go with waves, you know, yeah. you know from year to year. Um, but, yeah. So. Along those lines, because we were just looking at like the current numbers for charter, like what's been the trend with the charter numbers? Have they been? It's unpredictable. I'll be honest with you, you know, you get- Like over the last couple of years, say. Has it gone down, the charter route, or up? 
jobs <laughs> gone down recently. Okay. I don't know about the five-year trend. Where you have the issues is you have a couple of kids who may go, friends going, so they go too, so it, it kind of multiplies there. Um, and for those who, in the audience, the way the charter school works is they get, how it comes from Frontier, Frontier pays um, basically $20,000 for each student that goes out. We get $5,000 for each choice going in. So we talk about dollar signs above the heads of students. It doesn't actually really work out that way. So while we have a large number of <clears throat> a large number of school choice students in the building, we have to make up for the 40 students that are going out at $20,000 a head. So that adds up. So we're just barely, we're one of the few districts that are barely um, right side up instead of upside down in the charter. You can just imagine, when you look at the lists on page, whatever page that is of school sending, they're, they're hurt that the, the choice is page four. Yeah. Um, that they're up to, there, are, there are districts around us that are upside down by millions right. because of charter and choice. And so we're fortunate that Frontier is not, but. I noticed Hatfield is sticking out as kind of a sore thumb on the list there of like sending or receiving. That's interesting. Yep, and that also has to do with Hatfield also. Um, you have some border kids, mm -hmm. kids on the border who go there through elementary and stay right. all the way through. Um, you know, out of Waitley for the most part. So and we, you know, we trade a little bit with them. Um, yeah. yeah, see if you, if, you, if you actually look, we're an even trade with them right yeah. now. Yeah, I was so just looking at that. Students coming right. in, students kind coming of, out. So it's, like it's again, someone, they want a smaller school, and you have some people happily say, that's too small of a school. And so it's, again, it's, you know, choose your, I don't know, you're trying to, the grass is always greener in, on some of those choices. Yeah. That's why it's kind of hard to say, you know, when you have an even split like that. Mm. Right. Um, Happy so, should just, you should so, just so kind of this year, it's Too bad it wasn't an even financial split, you know, in that sense. Right. So this year you're planning on using what two hundred thousand from the E and D, yeah. and that's that's been going up the last few years. Is are there any specific programs that you're looking, or are you just looking at the total assessment to try to reduce the it's total to reduce assessment? the assessments? So there's no specific. Right. So our E and D is um, was a little higher, and I think when you look at E and D, we talked about this the other night at the Frontier Region regional meeting is that we know that these numbers are going to change with chapter center formula is going to go up slightly. That's the part where the E&D is to offset that. Some of that savings will go from back in E&D where we'll apply, you know, we're going to use E&D as much as we can in the future to, to offset um, the assessments to the towns. So do, do you, now, now do you guys utilize a formula to, to how you allocate your, your E&D or so like, and us, we uh, worked with the finance committee a few years ago and so when we look at our I hate the term free cash, uh, but when we look at our available revenue, we, we at the end of the year, we, we have a method of, mm -hmm. so we, we follow a process. Are you, do you look at something like so that? So that's what the school committee's been talking about this year. In okay. the past, I would say that there wasn't a methodical way of doing it. They're looking at a third, a third, and a third. A third to, to, to um, offset the assessment, a third to go to capital projects, and a third to keep free cash emergency and to carry over the following year. So that's part of the capital um, the capital that's committee that was created with select board members and school committee members mm -hmm. that met um, throughout this year and are bringing the capital plan forward, um, was to talk about ongoing taking care of those small needs in the school, by the school, um, and, and, and having a, a, you know, putting money from E&D into a capital stabilization account um, to take care of those problems as they go on forth. So, um, e and has gone up and down. The last few years we've seen some stability within that, um, but e and is a tough thing to call stable because it is. It takes, no, it, takes, it takes one bad, um, let's call it, we always call it the furnace, you know, the you know, $100,000 furnace fix and then your, your ND is then off moving forward, so. Um. Okay. <clears throat> any, any additional questions, Elliot? Um, on that proposed third, 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 uh, division, how is that in theory going to be affected by the proposed capital campaign? Well, the, no, not capital campaign. Well, the capital, capital. The, this is just going to take on um, debt and, and um, it's just kind of it sent out its promise note. It hasn't officially done that because we're waiting for it to be within the town, within um, the time limit for the town meetings to occur within our request for to go into debt. But 
So how does it look like going into that, you're saying? So what the, the Capital Planning Committee decided to do is put the big projects within, um, within the debt service and the smaller projects to move toward E&D and um, you know, the regular operational budget when possible. So taking care of the, the, the smaller things through E&D each year and then the, instead of, in the, in the beginning of our process, if you followed it, we had this list and we were, had a lot of the smaller projects kind of brought into, um, in within that plan and it just got, we felt it would have been easier to just put the bigger projects there and also um, creating capital plan moving forward for the, for the regional school that, that monitors those expenses and makes it part of its planning, you know, forward instead of just, what do we have this year? Let's, you know, instead, let's keep on top of that list. And so that capital planning committee is going to stay as a committee moving forward to oversee that, um, those expenditures and keeping an eye on the list. And so accountability, transparency for the towns, that kind of thing moving forward. So whether or not the membership will change is one thing, but the committee itself is um, agreed it was important to, um, to keep them together moving forward. So. And Scott was a member of that committee. So every now and then I'm looking at him just to nod to make sure I'm saying <laughs> exactly right. here. So far, so good. <clears throat> so on another note, how do you like sitting in the big chair now? Oh, it's been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, things are going great. Good. For the chair-wise, but you'll hear about their Sunderland's budget, the elementary budget, and you'll see that it's not as complex. That's, as all, that's why I said it now, Wayne. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Scotty. If, if I could, I want to thank the budget subcommittee and the administration for putting together this, this budget. I'd remind people, both in the gallery and people who are watching uh, maybe at home or in the future, ooh, future people, anyway, future people as well, uh, that, you know, we, this budget, its percentages presented to Sunderland are predicated on dropping 14 students off of the five-year enrollment. Right, that's important. Mm -hmm. It also is predicated on a relatively modest growth in the actual expense line that the total budget's turned into. Any given year, a member community in the in the district can get it. That's the 10% increase, the 11% increase. And this year, it happens to be Conway. We had an eight two years ago. We had a six three years ago. We had a nine four years ago. So it can be our turn any given year, depending on how the how the, and I'm glad the superintendent's nodding, it can come around. I would also, with, it with, does come around. with that said, it in will, the formula, yeah. right, in the district agreement, I would also say that as much as uh, the finance committee and the board of selectmen and the town, um, you know, push back and scrutinize and do our good cop, bad cop during budget season, if you look at uh, minimum contribution, and what the town's actually contributing, we pay a 33% premium to Frontier. The town of Sunderland pays a 33% premium above foundation budget. And that's been, as long as I've been on the Finance Committee or a member of the Board of Selectmen, that hasn't changed very, very much. So if you look at, if you look at minimum contribution of 1.19, our actual assessment of 1.69, we pay an additional $570,000, contribute an additional $570,000 or 33% to the education at Frontier. And I, thought I have to make sure that that's pointed out each and every budget cycle. The town doesn't go after you know, basic enrollment, it doesn't go after basic or foundation uh, revenue streams. We, pay, we know we pay a premium above that. Back, back to the thank you, Scott. Yeah. Well, well, but sometimes we forget. Oh, I understand. That, that's educational only. Right. Um, so the two hundred thousand you've taken out of E and D. When when Senator Joe and Representative Natalie get done with the governor, we, we should see um, regional transportation rise. Yeah. Um, Steve, Steve, and and our legislators have always have always worked. Paul Mark worked very hard on that. Are you going to keep that two hundred thousand and um, reduce the assessments additionally, or are you going to drop that two hundred thousand? Well, I so, think we, we try to be conservative with regard to the transportation number because, again, that's subject to oh right, oh yeah, we don't cuts in the middle of the year, so you you know you don't necessarily want to go and bank on that top 
that top number because if the state runs into a revenue issue, it could come down in the middle of the year. So you want to make sure that you're in a place that's comfortable um, and not a place that puts you in trouble. All right. So 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 basically, as I understand it, so so when I when I get that house too, when I see you went up sixty thousand dollars, I'm not going to get excited because you're not we're not going to we're not going to really be changing the budget, right? And even at that, those incremental, I understand what you, where you're going with it, those incremental pieces spread across the district agreement. I know. Well, I, I hear you. Yeah. But okay. So, so we'll take this, what you presented here will be your final, final number. Unless, unless, unless uh, the, the House and the, the Senate have some miraculous money where they found a billion dollars they're going to make a presentation <laughs> like and, they should uh, be doing. Yeah, they I mean, should be doing right revenue now. Revenue projections are, are off benchmark right yeah. now. So I, okay. it's not like yeah, I wouldn't take that to the bank. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm all set. Um, Finance Committee, Elliot, any questions? <clears throat> Additional questions? Guys? I think it's a good budget. I don't think there's much there. I think in a product you put out good. David? No, I'm fine. Yeah. Scott? All set. Uh, any questions from the audience? I think it's a good budget, too. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Anybody else want to comment? Um, Mr. Superintendent, you want to add anything, or are you all set? We're all set. Okay. So now for the other now. <laughs> so without, yeah, without, without, yeah, the easy part's done. <laughs> without, without without hearing anything uh, else, on, I'd like to uh, close the frontier portion of the budget, and we move on to the Sundown Elementary School. Is that okay with you guys? It's okay, Sundown Elementary. Thanks, Ben. So, Principal Barshevsky's Ben's handing out the uh, the budget. It's still in draft form, um, and I know many of the uh, members on both committees have been made aware that the elementary schools in a is in a financial um, a tough spot, financial pickle for right um, coming into this this season. We have a school choice. Um, deficit, and I'm going to have Judy, um, Dr. Wool, um, or Judy, um, explain to what the issue was, and then um, at some point I'm going to walk through proposed reductions in the budget to where we're at now. Now, as I say, this is a budget in, uh, um, we kind of had a first round at a, or a second round at the last school committee meeting where there was members here present, um, where we kind of explained where we're at. Um, we're kind of here today with a a budget that's still in still in draft form because there's a lot of moving parts that we're trying to get because there's reductions necessary we're trying to make sure we get it right and um, we're gonna have to work with the town um, to see how we can work together to um, come out of this budget develop a budget that is um, going to keep things as solid as possible at the elementary school so and what that looks like it's still um, a lot of uh, decisions and conversations to come. So, Dr. will give a little bit of a background to explain how we got into the mess that we're in um, and where we're at now. You, you okay to do that? Sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, the first couple of pages of the handout are the cherry sheet as it currently stands with uh, the governor's budget. There's a slight uptick in Chapter 70. On any given year, Usually what comes out of the legislature and gets signed by the governor is always more than that. Uh, and this year, um, how much more? Who knows? Um, that's something that uh, is still up for um, debate. On the receipt side, you'll notice that charter school reimbursement is at zero, and that's because there is no outgoing uh, charter school students this year. Was the Chapter 70 purely just a uh, X amount of dollars per student times enrollment? Is that, is what, is that basically what they're saying? What the reimbursement or the, the the chapter seventy number? Chapter seventy um, is your foundation enrollment. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just number of students times. Right. Okay. Right. And times they, a and whole they, lot of formulaic whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I I personally just I chuckle a lot when I whenever I go to a meeting and hear the 
the governors speak, and always we've never spent more on education. It's like, yeah, son, son will get another two thousand dollars this year. So, yeah. Okay. Like I so say, I'm and sorry. then you get most of the time the legislature will up that number, and by the time it comes out of the process, it is higher. Yep. Um, but with the push towards the foundation formula um, being reworked, there's actually some movement outside of the normal budget process to move that forward. Um, legislature is very active right now on that front, so it, there may be some things that come out actually ahead of the House One budget. Um, okay. But we'll have to see. Have to see where the territory lands. Thank you. So, um, also you can see your. Um, school choice uh, receiving tuition is down um, from uh, last year's initial. That $320,372 represents the December adjustment. Every year after the October 1st number is taken, there is an adjustment to school choice in December. So we're already $14,000 short in school choice from the December adjustment. So just um, just kind of an FYI that that's part of the landscape of what we're dealing with. So um, you can see that the total estimated receipts are, you know, $1,400, $1,300 and change more than they were last year. Second page is all the um, assessments. Um, and the assessments are up by a couple of thousand and so the net change is that you're actually down by a couple of thousand in terms of receipts at this point. This is only based on the governor's budget, so we um, have a long way to go in the budget process before we know um, the full thing. Uh, page four is sort of the 30,000 foot view of the budget as it stands. Um, and you can see, and actually, um, that should be three instructional assistants that have been cut out. Um, not two in that first uh, row, but you can see some um, projected adjustment. We have had to move a lot of salary offsets from school choice into the local budget, and I'll talk a little bit about that in uh, a bit. But um, you'll see that some cuts have already been made, and actually even more than this sheet was um, when this sheet was originally generated. Um, there's. Uh, the same kinds of issues with the business manager and TMS, um, those ins and outs that you saw in the Frontier budget also exist in the Sunland budget as well. Um, transportation, um, we actually came in at uh, $2 less per bus on the bus bid. Um, it's only one bidder and it is the current provider. Um, so the, the amount was increased, decreased by $2 per bus per day. So um, that was helpful. And the original, we had originally factored in a higher increase for special education transportation. We've gotten better <coughs> numbers, so we've been able to reduce that by about 5,000. So um, that's kind of where we are. Um, the next page talks a little bit about school choice. Um, and you can see the balance forward for, um, from 6.30 of 18 of $122,180.49. That's uh, our accounting office reconciling with the town. Um, there were some accrued payrolls. People who get paid on 26 pays, even though they're school year employees. So that made a net balance forward of 96198 We're anticipated revenue, um, again, for this fiscal year is that $320,372 amount that we just looked at. That was the first number on the cherry sheet. That is the December um, adjustment. That is the number now. Um, and that was decreased from 334 and change. So, um, so when you look at the balance forward plus the revenue, um, we have $416,570.77. Um, when I looked at what was budgeted for um, school choice along with um, some stipends for tutors that were not budgeted, we are anticipating an expenditure of 438544 um, if you played the budget scenario out, which would leave potentially school choice in a deficit of twenty-one thousand nine seventy-three twenty-three. Um, you, you gave the anticipated number versus the budget. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because <laughs> the anticipated expenditure is less than what was actually budgeted against it, but still, expenditures have outpaced 
revenues at this point. So you are at what we call in the budget world the funding cliff. Um, so um, yeah, budget there was four hundred sixty-six thousand dollars in uh, budgeted against uh, school choice, and the actually anticipated is a little less than that. But still, it's not as much as you as your balance forward and what you're bringing in. So um, Ben has uh, frozen as many of his discretionary lines as he can. Um, and so about $30,000 of um, those local lines will be used to offset that deficit. So that way the uh, school choice will end in a positive balance of $8,026.77 at this particular juncture in time. Again, anticipated revenue of 32372 moving forward because that's the jury sheet number, again, subject to whatever happens within school choice. So you have a totally anticipated revenue for FY20 of 328 uh, So trying to um, look at the lines and putting some things back into the local budget so that school choice could en end up in a positive way at the end of FY20 um, we are able to uh, come in at $7,495.12 uh, um, projected for the end of FY20. Um, that's not a really good place to be uh, in a school the size of Sunderland Elementary. You want to be carrying over about $50,000 a year in school choice to make up for the fluctuations of students coming in and out because for every student that comes in, there's a base rate of $5,000 per student. If they have special needs, there's this, what's called a special education increment that's added to that. It's based on the amount of services a student receives. So those students could potentially, um, you know, if you had somebody leave who had a special ed education increment and the total cost was, say, $16,000, that's sure. right off the top. Um, so for you to be in this place is a very tricky place to be right now. Um, and what we noticed is on the right hand side of um, the sheet you'll notice that in FY18 the original number for um, school choice was $390,518. The December adjustment was $334,592 because that's the number that carried forward to FY19. And so that's a reduction of $55,926. And there was an accounting error that did not pick up that December adjustment. So you've been on, and I'm noticing it more and more. When school choice first came out, most people held a year's worth of revenue and then didn't spend the current year and sort of spent in arrears. But as things have gotten tighter, more and more schools, Sunderland included, have dipped into current year income to the point where you have reached and gone beyond the tipping point. So that's um, where we are at. And how I first discovered all of this was when I saw the $14,000 drop for um, this year's school choice. I said, hmm, I should go into the budget and see if school choice can withstand that. And then I discovered that it couldn't. So um, that's where uh, we're at at this particular point in time. Um, page six has, um, you can see the ins and outs of school choice. There are 39 students coming into Sunderland Elementary through school choice, and there are 13 students going out. And you can see the towns and the grades uh, and the number of students that are going in and out as a result of that. So if you look at page seven, this sort of um, describes the conundrum that we're in. Again, the, uh, in FY18, school choice was um, originally set at 390.518. The December adjustment brought it down by 334.592, or a difference of $55,926. Um, again, school choice started out at the 334. We've had the December adjustment. An additional 14,220 um, has now come out. Um, based on the uh, anticipated shortfall with because of expenditures now outpacing revenues we're looking at a you know projected shortfall if we didn't correct for it of 21,973 uh, the 30,000 that uh, Mr. Barshevsky has uh, frozen will be applied we'll do some journal entries to offload the expenses on school choice so that at least it can end in the black uh, not by much but in the black 
So as you look down on page seven, here are some things that we're doing that have been done to also um, mitigate against um, percentages that would have been potentially double digits for someone in FY20. Three instructional assistants um, have been cut from the budget. Um, the food, direct, food service director's salary um, has been paid by the local. There is enough balance in food service revolving to be able to pay for that um, from that account, so that's what we're going to do. There's 5,000 in custodial temporary services that we um, believe that we can do without, so that has been cut. Um, we have a grant that is gonna allow us to offset some costs for the early childhood coordinator, that's $5,102. Um, and then there are a couple of things that we're hoping we can enter into a conversation with you about in terms of trying to do something for um, a couple of warrant articles. One is $13,342 um, to cover some uh, retirement expenses uh, next year. That's one and done. And then the second one is $20,000 for um, computer hardware. Um, that would be a one-time expense. We've also cut um, Spanish position and we've reduced occupational therapy um, from a full-time equivalent to uh, 0.8. Um, we had originally put in for an additional sixth grade teacher. Uh, right now, kindergarten looks like they might only need one instead of two sections. We're gonna keep our fingers and toes crossed and hope that that, that holds, um, but that would be a reduction of a, an additional teacher we originally put into uh, the mix. We had talked about increasing art um, to cover that additional classroom. That has been removed. And then special education transportation has been reduced by $5,200 um, based on those estimates for FY20. So we've already reduced the budget by $193,278.39. Um, The following page just kind of shows the assessments uh, in terms of the cost share split for um, the district at both uh, expenses that you share across the entire region and expenses that get shared across the union. And you'll notice that uh, Sunderland has had a, a slight dip from FY19 to FY20 in the percentage split for both um, the uh, union and at the regional level, and that's just because of the, the shifts in enrollment. So those shared costs are factored based on those percentages. <coughs> and then um, the rest of it is the line by line budget. Same kind of uh, thing that we do with um, the budgets um, in all of the schools that we work with. Again, is there's not that pink column, which is the all funds, which shows you the actual cost of things. So, for example, if you look on page 10, you'll notice that under the curriculum coordinator early childhood, you can now see off to the right a $5,120 offset for that grant. So that has reduced uh, that number down to $18,650 from $23,770. Um, you'll see it again on page 11, where salaries have been offset from a variety of sources. So the pink column shows you what the actual cost of all those salaries are. The blue column to the right shows what would be um, the town's share of that. And the rest is all offsets from either revolving accounts or grant funds. So when you finally get down to the bottom of it on page 16, and you can see, um, um, that the, uh, Right now, the projected increase is $193,679, um, or a 7.44% um, increase. So there's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one being that I know that number is very high. Um, and even within the cuts and such, I, I guess we should probably should start, if there's any clarification within the information that has been presented so far before we start moving on to um, other parts of this. It's your meeting and I'm taking over, but. I can um, we'll comment stop. on. We'll, we'll, we'll stop you if we have to. Yeah. On current kindergarten 
uh, antis, uh, anticipated kindergarten enrollment. As of this past Friday morning, it was 20. As of Monday morning, we're at 22. The, uh, just spoke to a new mom today. So looking at 22, and that's um, only accepting one school choice student who has a sibling in the upper grades. So that would not accepting any other school choice siblings. So taking kind of the bring, for those who've been listening to this conversation, so the, the initial problem is that the sixth grade sixth needs, grade. A, needs, needs a second teacher. Okay, so we put it in the budget, you know, the budgeting for um, addition of a teacher. Right. We've now since seen that the kindergarten enrollment was lower than, you know, there were 28 members uh, names that the town gave us. So, we, you know, we're going to assume, we assumed at that point it was gonna be two sections. Then upon, re after registration, it came down at 1920-ish. Mm -hmm. So Ben said, well, you know, here's a, here's a spot where we are kind of rolling the dice because um, you're going to get your most year fluctuation um, in early grades. You know, this town does have um, a population that does come and go. Um, and so that is a, you know, rolling the dice. It's a larger kindergarten class. I think it, you know, I was talking to Ben, it definitely maxes out at 25. Um, it's already at a point where it's kind of, it's higher than what we usually see and, um, and so forth. So that's kind of where we adjusted the budget because that is significant. That's a, that's a two percentage point difference by having this change in there. Yeah. However, it is a, right. it is a, it's a risk because you could have more families come in and I don't know what we do if in June we have 28. I don't know what we do. That's one of my questions today. Excuse me. Uh, no, we say. Darius or Ben, could one of you tell us what steps have been taken to reach the families of those 28 kindergarten students? I, heard, I have a rising kindergarten. I heard about it because I have an older child and I got an email from Ben. But mm -hmm. for rising kindergartners who are the oldest children and they're not already connected to the school, how might they have heard to sign up by now? So um, we received a couple different lists. Um, one from our incoming preschool students and then also from the town offices. The uh, difference in registrations compared to those on the, um, from the town office is about eight or nine. Um, Wendy Houle called all those families and um, found that like eight of them had, had moved out of town. Okay. Yeah. Right. Those could be replaced by people moving in over the yeah. summer that you wouldn't know about. Right. September 1st. 22 is an alarming kindergarten size. I'm a teacher. It's I work with kindergarten. 20, 22 is a, a very big and busy kindergarten class. It's it's one thing to have 22 sixth graders. Yeah. Um, it's much, much different what, what with I'm five year olds. That number could go up to 28, sure. 30 on September We've, 1st. Uh, our current fifth grade class, when they were going into second grade, had nine students moving to town. And, yeah. and as I understand this, the this present budget includes eliminating one teacher, or, or, or not hiring one teacher, not hiring one teacher, and several teachers still coming out of school choice funds. Their salary, is that correct? Yes. Yes. But it's reducing, so as you can see in the school choice numbers page, our revenue coming in from school choice has dropped by over 100 in yeah, yes, I, and I, change. I so yeah. we had to take, we had to take the, put it onto the local budget, we had to take those salaries and put it onto the local budget, and that's what's increasing the percentage rate to so, the town. So before this budget, how many teacher salaries were coming out of school choice funds versus this budget? Well, She'll pull it up. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, that'd be like two or two or three more. Oh, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. So we're There's funding we're funding teachers on school choice funding that's not a guaranteed line assignment. Correct. It's not a guaranteed funding source. Correct. It's flexible, so you Robert Peter to pay for. You are when you reach when you go beyond that. Well, we're not Robin Peter Pay Paul. It's a it's a revenue source right. that isn't consistent. Right. right. And so, in any given year, um, you could have students you know who are school choiced in who then move, and then they're not school choiced in anymore. Um, you know, so you have those or choose to go elsewhere. Mostly, it's, it's been moving those kind of things. So each one of those plus it's five thousand dollars plus a sped increment. If a student is on a special needs plan, so some of those we're saying, I thought it's $5,000, you've seen these odd numbers. There are other things that are added on to those numbers. So if you had a, 
a choice student who had received some extra services by the school for a special education plan move out, that could be a $20,000 change by one student alone. So that's why it gets very, um, so we have that compounded with the $55,000 not changing the enrollment to mid-year enrollment based on the beginning of the year enrollment. So we, we, we compounded that on top of a year where we need another teacher based on enrollment of Sunderland students. So you can see we've hit a, a perfect storm of a mess. And so, um, and so we've already taken, you know, measures this year to, um, to reduce the budget this year by freezing the budget. And going into, when we talk about the computers line item on that page, computer hardware. Um, so one of the, you know, again, this is probably one step further, but it, just so it, I can explain what we've done there. So we were scheduled to replace the computers in the library this year. Okay, mid-year, we realized we we're gonna find so we put a, we, we stalled it, trying to see our way through it. Now we've frozen it. So the $20,000 or $18,000 that was left in that account to buy computers, we froze from this year, we put it to next year, but next year we're gonna have to eliminate that to get that $20,000. So the question, one of the questions within this budget is, can we do it as a capital improvement to the school for computers just for specific hardware for you know computers for the library of the school to pull it out of the budget eventually we're going to have to get that line back in because hardware includes printers includes the infrastructure um you know from wiring to servers to all that kind of things as well so but we're trying to with each cut we're trying to figure out how can we be smart about it and so that was just one within there you know that's it's removing twenty thousand dollars but how can we still um get that service to the to the kids you know if it can't be made up then it's gonna be something to have to go without so, but that's, you know, that was, and then the other one was the uh, insurance, uh, retirement um, payout. It's a one-time expense. I know retirements happen if every year, if not every other year. So it's a one-time expense, but it is something that we pulled out in the past. So to me, that was kind of a no-brainer. I even tried to push it further, kind of got the push back at the um, last school community meeting about trying to put, you know, um, custodial supplies on a warrant instead of within the budget but that's kind of that's pushing I, I i know that's pushing it but i'm trying to find every dollar i can to reduce that overall um, percentage point and put it kind of categorized in a different way to save programming to the students so um that's kind of where those those two other numbers have done ask those questions there so um in answer to your question, there were uh, three classroom teachers and a kindergarten teacher. Yeah. Three classroom teachers and a kindergarten teacher were originally set to be offset by school choice. We're down to one classroom teacher and a kindergarten teacher being offset. So we've brought two classroom teachers into the local budget. And, and just one, when did school choice start? What year? 90, 93. Early 90s. Yeah, late 90. It's been around a while. Yeah. yeah. It's at Ed Reform. Yeah, well, this, the second iteration of Ed Reform in 2002. So you're trying to move the, some of the computer stuff off to Capital? <clears throat> 401 article. Yeah. On to Capital. Another way of getting them that's outside the school budget. Mm -hmm. Again, well, no, there could I be think some I'm arguments ahead for because that. we're still dealing with a, a budget number that's that's that I know is going to require conversation. But mm. within some of those cuts, you know, I'm just showing the amount. Of, I'm just showing. We're having a lot of conversations around each kind of thing. So, you know, basically where we're at now is what can the town? This is a, on top of that. What's not explained in here is within those school choice numbers. Is we have two student tuition ins that are now graduating, they're going on to seventh grade. Those tuition ends we talk about into the Horizons program, you're talking about over $100,000 worth of revenue there as well. So you start lining up all these things of this perfect storm that our tuition in students who were, who came with a, a pretty good revenue um, with them are leaving. Um, we were upside down in school choice just by regular numbers. We had an accounting error of $55,000 that we had to make up for this year as well. We have to increase a, a classroom teacher that we're now kind of playing back and forth with regular, you know, regular growth numbers, which is you know you are going to be around three or four percent regular growth anyways. So now you're seeing how the original number that we talked about the last school meeting was at twelve percent, 
And so these are the cuts that get us down to of 100 and, 193,000 that are getting us now to um, the, the 7.44%. And so the question is, so I know what the next question will be, is what else? What, el what else is there moving the budget? So Ben and I have gone, and, and Judy, have gone line by line through the, the budget. There is, there is nothing else that does not substantially um, affect the programming of the school. And so I have a, um, a sheet that, that outlines what's in the budget lines that aren't outlined here as cuts. Um, when we want to get to that, but I want to make sure before we get to that, it's a that we're all set. I don't want to kind of just bounce all over the place because that gets very it's gonna get emotionally charged because you're talking about mm -hmm. arts, you're talking about all the things that make the specialists of the school, and so I want to make sure everybody else is kind of it's gonna be hard. I don't want to be bouncing around, but I don't want to control, I do want to control the meeting, but I don't want to control the meeting, you know. How it works. <laughs> <Good> question, <laughs> Good question in the back of the room. <clears throat> One question I know it's been asked by the select board and the finance committees in prior years about the Dark Horizons program. And somehow, could we get what is the tuition coming in? What do we spend on it, even on the town side? Um, you know, because the town does benefits for the employees to see, you know, is that a really sustaining program for our school at this present time? Um, you know, all the costs that are incurred on that program, especially if space is going to be an issue too. Um, my own personal opinion, 22 kids in kindergarten, it just seems um, too risky to take that teacher out at this time. And because kids come in, you know, our, we're a transient town, we're um, affiliated with UMass, so you get a lot of students, you get uh, professors uh, that are coming in at that September time where Sunderland can see a big growth um, in the grade. I think it's happened in prior kindergarten. I know it's happened this year. Um, so I, I, I would be really cautious about that. Um, and the other thing is just because I don't have all night and I'm not going to be able to go to the other public hearing. Um, I'm not really seeing a good fix to this besides another override, which is also very hard for Sunderland because we just passed one last year. Um, so I think that has to be put on the table, but I think a lot of careful thought has to go into that because we have a big population that is um, it's hard for them to have their taxes raised. Um, so I, I would think that a number would have to be a thoughtful number so that it, it's not something that would be doable for everyone in the town. I know I'm skipping way ahead for you. Before you need to be there, but if I leave or it gets talked about, it, like, I, I would, I would hope that that So, just just reminder, okay. I I'm I'm like the catcher, and you guys are the pitcher. So I'm I'm the only one that's watching the ball game ahead of me. So if you have a question or have a comment, just raise your hand, and I'll I'll see you. Um, I'd like to. Um, if someone's making a point, let, get, let the point get done and don't get nervous. I will call on you, but um, we just want to keep the discussion flowing, okay? Um, but I will see you just, just uh, and either, and if I, if I miss you, Scott or David will give me a, yeah. a heads up. First and third baseline coaches. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so don't, just, and, and again, I, I'll get, I will get to you with your questions. You had a question? Do you know how many students will be in Horizons next year? We have our students who are tuitioned in leaving. Yes, but how many students will leave, like that classroom, the tools, and those specific teachers, do you know? We're currently looking at all of our spend numbers and trying to figure out what the best 
model is. Um, I will say that, and you know, Wendy, you had made a comment about the tuition and the, you know, for the students coming into the Horizons program, that st program started in the fall of 2013 because there are students across the entire district that met a certain profile um, that made sense to put in a behavior, uh, a, a program for students with high behavior, low, co low cog. And that's how it kind of started in the first place. And those um, students are in seventh grade now, right? Those students or are in sixth, sixth grade. grade. Okay. Yep, those students are in sixth grade. Um, aside from the one-on-one -on -one support that those students receive, the money that the tuition, um, the money those, those students brought in supported positions across the entire school, right? So with that SPED revolving account, we would need those other positions whether we had the Horizons program or not. We would need the, the related services. And so I think that's something very, that we really need to um, keep, keep in mind. Um, currently we have three sixth graders and one fifth grader. The fifth grader will be going to another town next year and the sixth graders will be moving on. Just this past year, we added a special education teacher and early childhood interventionist, um, which has absolutely wor worked wonders. Um, so we would be looking at kind of a, a, a restructuring of our special education department as a whole. And our numbers are still very high across the entire school, with around 50 students receiving IEP services. And that's pre-K pre through six. Did that kind of answer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I kind of feel the same way with the kindergarten teacher. I think that shouldn't even be on the table, because considering the high needs, the, you know, the percentage of high needs and all that stuff, and we are going to need to hire another teacher eventually anyway. And my own child was a sixth grader and ended up with a class of 20 from October. He was the 25th and, um, from October, the end of that year, it was yeah. 30 sixth graders. And we could barely put them in the room. It's just not, you just don't know. And I feel like, I, with the little kids especially, yeah. it's not going to be desirable. And with your, your oldest um, child that started off as 23 students in, in fifth grade, um, and by the time they graduated, they were at um, 30. Yeah, so and, and, it, and I would say that um, 22 kindergartners um, is, a, is a big number. It's very, very busy. And we, we try to, um, if, if the in-town um, if the in-town registrations for kindergarten um, were an obvious two classes, we would be looking to cap kindergarten classes with 16 to 18 students. Um, that's including school choice. So we ne we've never accepted school choice numbers to create a section. We have accepted school choice to kind of help fill a classroom. And that's what we've done across all grade levels. Nathaniel? Um. You, you said that there, there, if we do end up going over that number, we don't have a, a, an answer. I think that's where it's a lot about, you know, if we don't have an answer for what happens if we have 30 students come September, um, then I don't really have a choice as to whether or not we're going to have that position or not because we, we, we can't go forward with, a, with an option that could potentially end up having less, with no, with no, no teacher hire, you know, 30, 30 kids, 32 kids in a class. Um, but also, you were saying before that you were you were talking looking to um, freeze school choice students coming into the kindergarten class to try to keep that number low. Would it make more sense for us to start talking about having the two classes and instead of freezing that number, look to um, you know maybe even campaign to get kids from other districts into the kindergarten class so we can have two classes, make them each have 15 kids in the class, and then have that extra tuition from the school choice make a difference. We we currently have five school choice um, kindergarten registrations for next school year, one including a sibling of a student in upper grades. Um, uh, from, from my understanding that fiscally it doesn't make sense to create an additional section of a, any grade level just purely on school choice. And it ends up costing more than that money would bring in. 
Right. It, is it accurate that the current fourth grade is also a single classroom, so we'll have this situation again in two years? Current, currently, we have one sixth grade class and one fourth grade class. So we'll, right. we'll just be looking at this again in two years, and we will have keep having two kindergarten teachers next year would be part of a long-term plan for having adequate staffing for everybody, because this will just happen again in two years. Okay. Bruce? You know, historically, this has happened in Sunderland before. You know, back in the 90s, we had a big population increase, uh, like in room school then. And we, we finally got the school built up to have two teachers for each classroom. And that was probably in 2003, 2004. And then when, when fiscal crunch hit, they started going down and eliminating teachers. And then they started going to funding teachers for school choice and, and that kind of thing. It, it's tough to swallow, but I think at some point, we have to, as a town, say, hey, we're gonna have two teachers for each class, and it has to come from taxpayer dollars, and not depend on the school choice, and not depend on the special ed horizon program, or whatever it is, and then the other money, either turn it back to the town at the end of the year, or, you know, you, you, you use that as your, as your funding, but, I, I think this is going to keep happening in Sunderland as his populations turn over. And, and I know, you know, we worked hard to get that back up in those days, and, and I think that's eventually what we have to do, and we just have to say, yeah, we're going to do it as a town and be done with it. Francis? I would say that Bruce is right on this point because <laughs> yeah, it was like, a qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, we, we have to first of all, we have a very good product right now. And my biggest fear is if we start taking on the edges, we lose the good name of the community mean, for our school. And because we are a, a, you know, a school that's tied to the UMass, better for worse. We do have a, a, a reputation which we have to maintain. I just don't, what we, the, my biggest fear is we have 22 kids in kindergarten and something goes wrong, one, because one thing, that's all it takes. Sure. And we will wish we could spend money in first place to avoid the situation. I really think that as a town, we have to decide which way we want to go. And I firmly believe that having, I say this because my kids went through what I call the eight days of, of, of this town school. If we have two classes for each grade and we budget, you know, this into every age of our budget and maintain this, we have a system in place that will begin to sell itself going forward. That's it. So, um, I mean, I totally agree that I think the most stable thing would be to have two class model, but um, I just want to get the numbers down for what would the, first of all, is, so if somebody has, if there's a, you mentioned like an, an older sibling or something, mm -hmm. are we then forced to take the younger kid too, or can we turn that away? I don't know if it's a an, an official policy, mm -hmm. um, but it's the the practice that you know if we if we're accepting a school choice student in for the 2019-20 school year, that that family kind of knows that in three years when their youngest is coming up, um, they'll they'll be a part of the school. Okay. Um, There's no way to like trim the like student numbers that way. No. Yeah. So we'd have to look at we would have to look at policy on that. Yeah, I think the practice has been that um, siblings have gotten first. If there was a lottery system, siblings got mm -hmm. first That's a um, yeah. first dibs. But if there's no openings, right. I'm going to guess that you could you could go you could probably cut that person out. I, mean, I, I don't want. Yeah. I think we're talking about a real person here, so I'm just trying. I'm just but I'm, I'm speculating yeah. the policy that right. if you're not allowing school choice, you're not allowing school choice. Period, and there would be no exceptions to it. So. Um, um, I, mean, I think it would be, be 
we, we risk the long-term financial health more by making austerity moves and making cuts than in making the investment now. And, and if you look at the numbers in terms of school choice, we're bringing a lot more money into school choice in than we're sending out. And if we make all these cuts, we mean Spanish is sort of, it looks like throwing off the table at this point. Um, but we start losing arts, we start losing um, some of these extra programs that make our school as special as it is. What we're going to see is next year we're going to have less school choice money coming in, and we're going to be back here making the same cuts, but harder cuts. Um, I think if anything, what we should do as a town is trying to make the school as attractive as we can to school choice people in the district, um, and try to make that make the difference for us. The, um, I mean, the, the, our arts programs are the heart and soul of any school. Of any school. Um, you know, you I think when Darius and I met with our uh, the Sunderland faculty a couple weeks ago, you know, he made the analogy that you know, like what what does a bare bones budget look like? It's you know basically third floor classroom, desks, students, pencil, paper, and then and and nothing else. Um, and and I know that that's that's not you know what our district believes in, and I know that's not what our town believes in. Elliot. The three IA positions that are being cut yep. are, any, are, are some of those associated with the Horizons program? So, 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 so they are, um, but as you know, when we, have, when we have students leaving, we also have students um, coming in, right? Coming up from the, the younger grades, from preschool transitioning to, into kindergarten. Um, and there's definitely needs and identified needs and projected needs through uh, reach students that are coming up as as well. How many IAs is that going to leave the school for if three are cut? That would leave us with 24, 24 instructional assistants. Yeah. Would that have to be upped if we increase the teacher as well for kindergarten? You know, what's your normal ratio of teachers and IAs? We were we were projecting for next year's kindergarten classes if we had two. Mm -hmm. um, two instructional assistants in each kindergarten class. Um, and that's um, usually we've had one IA per kindergarten class, but this is just based on needs. So if we were going with our current roster and anticipated roster, we were anticipating having a classroom teacher and three instructional assistants associated with our kindergarten students. Wendy? Um, my my oldest son, when he was in kindergarten, there were half days. There were 25 kids in each session. So there was 50 kids um, total. They didn't have the needs that the kids now have. And, and the bodies in the classroom is big on what you can and can't do. Um, and I think everybody's aware of that. But um, I, I think it's ridiculous to even think of taking that out. And, and Sunderland does traditionally go big in the lower grades, and once they get to fourth grade, they kind of sometimes taper down. Um, but my real question is, we usually spend, I think Scott, you said at the last meeting, about a $100,000 increase from one budget year for the school. It's, it's, been, it's been in that range the last couple of years. So what is the deficit Minus that normal increase that we're talking about now. Because I'm confused. That's currently about $100,000. It's $100,000. We're looking right now on top of, of what a normal loan would be. So but that, that's also taking out, and we're freezing programs yeah. that or we're going to be taking out <coughs> that is not going to last. You know, we can't keep doing that year and year. It's not like. You're taking something out because it's never coming back, right? I, I'm thinking technology probably is reoccurring every year at the school. Yeah. Yep. Scott? Just, just to keep this in kind of a, a steady framework, your original budget, if I take the 193 and propose reductions, and the 193 you're proposing to pass on was in the north of $380,000. I think that's important to bear in mind. We talk about cuts, right, versus a budget. So the, the budget that was being developed 
was almost just short of four hundred thousand dollars. That is nothing the town can do on any given year without going to the voters and asking for an override. We're we're good for one sixty three to one eighty in any given year, depending on growth, and that's it. It took a long time to to have to pass what happened last year. And Peter and I have had discussions in the past about, you know, what's the what's the crystal ball and you know what's the magic number and there really isn't ever a magic number. I mean, it's it's, it's temperament and mood and national mood and local mood. So as we talk about this, it's important to bear in mind a hundred ninety three thousand dollar requested increase in the operating budget, nearly one ninety four, does reflect some reductions in either program or staff. I'll keep that in context. No, no. No. Oh, I said it's important. Well, the closing sentence or from the beginning? Closing okay, sentence. so the, the, the closing sentence was a, an increased request for funding of $194,000 still represents a reduction in services and staff at the school. Alex? So I, I just want to make another big picture point, um, piggybacking off of that. And the previous discussion of, I mean, the school budget is I think coming up on like 40% of the town budget. Okay. So if we're going to spend that much money, you might as well do it right, rather than coming back in September and having to do like an emergency town meeting for that extra teacher because, you know, we're trying to save a few dozen dollars here or there for that. Bruce? I think looking down the road, too, you have to remember we have, what, 120, 130 units of new housing going in? 150. And, uh, 150. Shiggle, whatever they want to call it. And, and some percentage is going to come into the Some percentage is going to add to the class. <coughs> that's a couple of years down the road, but also that's going to bring in some more revenue. But as we all know, the, the cheapest form of revenue for the town is open space. And, you know, that's not going to cover the cost. But we have to remember that going down the road that, you know, if we have a basic infrastructure in the schools and the towns, then the increases are going to be substantial. Good point, Bruce. Let's say we we moved here uh, in the summer about a student and with us and uh, when we have a family or a kid. Um, literally we're staying in Sandra because of the family oriented what we see as a town. We didn't want to go to Amherst because it was more like school oriented, you know, more houses are not really are for a single person, rather for a family. And then, you know, you ended up coming to this community. And uh, it, this is no, this is our family. And as a family, we wanted to stay right here because of that reason. And I see, I remember, you know, uh, this decision didn't come early in time because if we take in consideration that you must have the latest uh, uh, decision taken of uh, the schools. Mm -hmm. The decision is taken in March, and you uh, request the letters arrive around April. So basically, families, most families, they decided to move to Massachusetts or from wherever they are. Uh, we're talking about June, July. Mm -hmm. So when we decide to come to with our families is and look school districts and all this stuff is we're talking about July August sometimes. So it is twenty two saying it, it seems you know we can try to tie it up twenty two but I'm quite sure my food <laughs> because no no most of the families choose sugar off because it has that. There's not only the apartment, but you have a park, you have this and that, that you can actually raise a family rather than just be in a little space contained, you know? So I think that thinking about that fluctuation, you won't have really a number per se. To, you know? mm. And then I think the numbers are going to increase because that's uh, most families, they, they rather to be in a place where you can actually live. I just want to say that it is very 22 seems nice to contain something, but I think the numbers it will increase with me. I just want to say. That.
briefly, it would seem that there's two issues here. One issue is um, the deficit at hand, and the other issue, which can be a, a longer term conversation, is how we want to fund the schools. Do we want to fund the schools haphazardly like this every budget cycle and move money from school choice and around the, around the wheel and try to fund teacher positions in that way? Or do we want to actually fund the school from the town budget without school choice dollars attaching them to teachers? But in the short term, we've got a deficit, which is what I'm hearing from this select board, that we have to deal with. And we're limited what we can do if we don't go to uh, town meeting and ask the money in that regard. So um, I think what everybody's saying here is important and people should voice their opinions, but in the short term we have to deal with the acute issue of the deficit. Mm -hmm. Two cents. It's, it's interesting because I guess I, I must have missed something along the way because I always thought that school choice was to fund, was used to fund enhancements at the elementary school. It wasn't meant to fund teachers' positions. It was, it was to fund um, like a, um, it was to bring in like an art teacher or uh, a language teacher or to, to enhance the educational, <clears throat> it was to enhance the educational uh, value for our students, and that's why we use school choice. So I, I, I've been sitting here for a while now, a little disappointed that somehow that changed to the tune of um, a majority of the uh, school choice money being used for, um, to pay for positions that are reoccurring that's 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 hard um but i thought we were funding education from our tax dollars we, we were in fact yeah so and and, and now and it's you know the year that, <laughs> that, that, that changed right i mean well, or, or yeah i mean a dramatic piece of that right in 2010 like because some of these all of these things that i'm listening to are eerily familiar <laughs> i mean because the the you know, the rest of the support we had yeah. uh, went down dramatically uh, from the state, and um, and where do we make that up from? You know, we uh, we actually had a, cr uh, a choice. You know, it made it worse for for uh, a year or two. Um, We've seen what happens. Families participating in the town. I think it actually drew people back and actually drew more people in. Um, um, and and in fact, you know, but we because of where we were financially, uh, that was funding regular recurring operating budget costs, not looking to do extra stuff with that. And that you know, seen this movie uh, play out in all kinds of contexts um, before. I mean, you know, lottery money was supposed to be extras, and then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes right. money that's counted on. So it's frustrating, um, and I think as a town. You know, uh, it, it, I think it would, we, we'd all love to be where we're talking about. Um, we know what it, I think, what it means to do that. Or, you know, and is there, can we, can we achieve that? Like, can, could we, you know, go back to the town and say, hey, we want to, we really want to have this be sustainable. We, this is the population we've got. It's gone back up. It costs more uh, to run a school here because we've got more kids in the school. Um, and we need you to pay for it. Well, I, you know, I, was, I was trying to get to um, before. <laughs> I, I know you've been the chair of the school committee for a while, but um, thank you. I know. I just gave you a hard time, but but it, it it's a it's an interesting conversation. And and what I would say is that the first thing I I think we have to schedule a meeting between the school committee and the finance and. And select board in the very near future to understand exactly where you where you're going because what I'm about to say, I hope it'll make a sense. If 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 and, and you have to understand from the board of, board of selectmen's perspective, a budget. There's two components of a, a budget. There's a 
there's a expenditure which we're talking about today but there's also revenue and and most of the time we we really haven't talked about revenue yet um, Sherry Sherry's been putting together some numbers but we haven't sat down with the finance committee to talk about revenue numbers yet because that's that's a very important uh, part of our budget processing or the, the process but it, it's it's so then you also have to look at the expenditure side that we're that we're we, we're doing right now also but it's interesting to me because I, I heard what been said and to talk about funding education from the from the budget and back going back to school choice being enha enhancement. But if I listen to Ben, the principal and the superintendent and our financial guru, and thank you for the wonderful presentation. It's very, it's very easy for me to follow this year, so thank you very much for that. But when I, when I look at those things, the number, the, the number that's presented here on our paper still doesn't address the education educational component I would say if I was if I've been listening correctly um, so you don't I, I don't think we have a true budget at the present time that's why I said that we would need to meet with the finance committee select board and the school committee to understand a true budget that would accomplish the goals that we're looking that's that's being put forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, who, who's the chair of the school committee right now? Are you Doug? Greg, actually, Greg, it's Greg. I'm here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Can't be here. So, I, I'm I'm confused. Yeah. Well, I, so I, I, well, we, we had a we had a a budget. Yeah. That we brought forward with all the changes to 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 do status. Mm hmm level funded programming moving forward yeah and that, that was at that was at around 12 percent okay and so that was what we originally proposed um not proposed that we put out there this is what it looks like we then made um we started going down the difficult road of reducing costs in order to make a budget that was could be financed by towns we i would if we were talking about you're talking about a half a million dollar difference between or just short of a half million dollar difference um, between the loss of revenue because you remember it's not just if you keep this in mind it's not that the cost of the school we're asking to change or add anything it's just the revenue source that we were using which is school choice has gone down through in multiple in, in multiple ways from a spend increments from a programmed in students and over $150,000 in just adjustments, $50,000, which was an, also an error, which is, no, I, you know, no. so, but I wanna, I mean, repeating but, it but, for, for everybody to kind of comp, but, you know, to take what, in. What I'm saying, no, in, 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 unfortunately or unfortunately, I've sat in a seat for many years, um, and, and if this is not the first time we talked about enrollment, um, Doug's just getting done on his, third term so that's nine years um, we we probably how many times have we talked about enrollment at this time of kindergartners being about 20 and we end up with 30 that's not all right so what I'm saying is that so we have a budget now and someone said it early are, are you going to start the year with with a 30 student kindergarten class I would say probably not so we don't have we don't really have an accurate budget right now and 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 because in 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 so so in, in the a teacher if you brought him in on a low brought the person in the teacher on the lowest step you're probably looking at 47 48 thousand dollars and and maybe right. fifty thousand in that range right so all of a sudden we find ourselves fifty thousand dollars behind. So we so we make it through we we make it through FY twenty. Then what happens when FY twenty one comes around? So we're beating our and, and guess what? You're going to have to keep those two teachers right up through. And fourth grade and sixth grade now have one teacher. So you're going to have to replace it. What that's what Bruce was saying. Uh, I don't agree with him very often, but I understand where he was going. So so right, I understand. Well, we had sometimes we had three. Yeah. But 
but so the thing is, we're not, we're not. If you decided, if if we as a community decided to do something, we need to solve the problem. So address the problem a hundred percent, not sixty percent, or twenty percent, or fifty percent. So so that's what I'm saying. I guess where I'm at is that the schools. We need the town in order to make this budget work. Just looking at the numbers itself. So we're going to need the town in, in some way, shape, or form, because this, this, the, the percentage of this budget, as we know based on past history, based on growth of the town, is going to have to come. When you look at programmatically, like how does the town fund schools? That's a whole another question. You, is, a, is a rabbit hole that the you know the per pupil spending of the town of Sunderland for students is lower. Than, than all of its neighbors. I mean, I mean, we look around to find who spends less per student for education. That is the core why there's no money in the bank for the school. You know, I mean, I mean that's a longer, and you guys have been around a long time and, and how it's got to where it's at. Well, and I can tell you how that happened. I, I can tell you that the state used to pay 64, 65, 67 percent of education costs for the town of Sunderland, not too long ago. And now the state is paying 30%, 25%. I have an amazing amount of free time, I guess, to know that kind of stuff. But, that, but that's, what, that's what we do. So, so and, and, and that's why it bothers me when I, when I, hear, when I hear the governor in Boston tell, tell me in Boston that we, we're spending record numbers of money for education. Well, not from where I'm looking. It's always going to be record because it's always going up because of inflation, right? Right. right. Well, exactly. I, it's, but, it's, but it's from, from, from where I'm, I'm looking at it, 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 I'm not seeing that. So, so, so there's been a fundamental, sh so there's been a fundamental shift. And I, I remember back in the early 2000s saying, you know, when this thing, because you, I, you were looking at other towns were paying 60 percent back then, and we were paying 25, 30 percent, and saying. And, and I don't know how the numbers shifted, but they have shifted. So now we're paying a, a much larger per percentage of our budget. That's why it's harder for us to catch up because other towns have had 40 years head start on us. That, 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 that's, what, that's, what, that's what's happening. It's take a while for it to happen. But, but if you're gonna have a conversation, if, if you have, if you, if you, when, you, when, you talk, when you talk to, the only thing I think people want from, a, from elected officials is to be told to have an honest conversation to go back and forth, and that's what I'm saying. If we go up 194,000 and we need to go 194,000 again next year, we haven't had that honest conversation. So, so when 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 we're going, David's go, David's spending his nights going to to uh, union negotiations, and and we find out how much the contract right, increased by five percent or three percent, two percent, whatever the numbers is, but it's wasted because it's because we're trying to manage a budget but we don't have those real numbers. So I said we, we nearly need real numbers to have an honest conversation. And now, now if you tell me you wanna go, that the increase of so 12%. So with those, what are, my first budget cycle, and it's, it's, it's so, I'm, I'm learning a little bit as well here, is, but what do you need from the school? What does both the finance community and the select board need from the schools for information to help with that data in order to because that's because at the last school committee meeting, the, the members from each community that were there said, "Well, we don't have." We said, "We said, what should we? What number?" Because we start making reductions, we hope to do it smart, surgically, least them a lot of collateral damage as possible to any programs or any kind of services. So you know that's how we approached it. But well, we don't know how how deep we're cutting because we don't know we don't know to what level the town wants to take an approach because. You know, do we want to go for an override? Do we want to, where do we plant the, the flag and say this is as far as, we, you know, I can plant a flag because I, I do have a budget marker where I, the flag, I have a flag that's going to be planted that says we're not going to go any further than this. And, you know, we'll put it to townspeople about how they want to, how they want to. The, the 194,000, and, and I'm speaking just math, pure math right now. 194,000. If if you come forward and you stick with 194,000 as as it is, not and it's really not. And I'm, this is my assessment of what I've heard tonight. The 194,000 doesn't meet the requirements in the elementary school. Okay, that's my assessment. I may be wrong, but it would, but even with that 194,000, you'd have to have an override to meet that number. Pretty close. 
because we only have $180,000 worth of, of, of new growth. So our, our maximum levy capacity increase to 2.5%, which by, by law we have to follow, is like $180,000. We say $200,000. Say $200, so that means the highway department, police department, library, um, frontier. every other frontier, frontier, so frontier nothing would, would get any increases. And the elementary would, would that runs, what, 40% of our budget, budget, the elementary, would take 100% of our new growth. And no one else could get any increases. So 194000 is, I mean, we, we could do it, but no one else would get anything. But you're not having, the, but we're still not having the real conversation. The real conversation is what do you really need? To, 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 to stop the cycle. So, so what you'd like to see is if we weren't if we weren't trying to get it down to something that that seemed more palatable, what what would you know? But without like just throwing in, I mean, just really what we what we think is appropriate, you know, the most appropriate. Um, what that would be that would you know probably. Include an, uh, the the a second kindergarten teacher, um, so an additional teacher, um, and I mean the the other piece in here is is that if, if we, as we've talked about if we were moving away from funding recurring especially teacher um, out of school choice if uh, we did that in this that and didn't cut our school choice balance at the end of this thing as as closely as this still is doing to get it down to this it's we're still shaving it like to the cliff's edge we're just not going over the cliff which we can't do obviously right. legally so <clears throat> if we did that i mean i think that's a good i think that's a good well, I discussion think you have time look at that and say this is what it would i i think take. but at the same time it, it's more it's more it's more important than that it, it's more in depth than that you also you also need to come into us and, sh and ha show us show us or work with us to, to establish a plan so that we we know how school choice money is being spent. We we understand how it's going to be spent in the future. We understand um, what it's not going to be used for, and, and those things are put down in writing. So we under we understand that we we're making strides to uh, codify, for lack of a better word, our budget so that our budget for the school is a definition so when we look at it we can say okay we're at this is why we're have to increase the budget this year because we're adding five new kids so we add five new kids and so that's what i that's what i would look at let's do a basically asking for a different way of doing business i don't think we want to be here again in the near future so. well the only thing from a political standpoint is we could very well be here because we need to have this discussion about what we want to have there's the academic argument of what you want to have, and then there's the political reality of what you're going to get. So we have to also mentally be prepared for, we may ask for something, but we may really not get it. Because we've been here before, and I, Doug and I have been through this before too, and we've seen the numbers, and we know the results of what happens when you make all those cuts, and we understand all the academic arguments. But as, without getting too far off stream, we've seen reality and academic arguments have really diverged over the last two and a half years, I'll say, and I'll just leave it at that, you know? So it's, there's a lot going on here. Scotty? I guess I guess I would, having listened most of the night, it was the budget presentation, and yeah. we've had more than one meeting the last year or so, Mr. Modesto and mm -hmm. I. Um, I would, I would, um, I would applaud the effort to put a recurring expenses on a recurring revenue stream. I sound like a broken record year after budget year after budget year about that. I applaud that effort. I would hope for maybe some. I would hope for maybe some guidance as to how they got to a point where a program like name a program was sprinkled throughout the entire operating budget, and if a program's revenue stream isn't linear to the program you know that that to me doesn't sound like it's a sustainable model and again you can put a name uh, use your horizons program if, if the revenues from the horizons program is sprinkled across the operating budget 
and areas that aren't necessarily associated with the Horizons program. They're not completely linear. Then we're going back to the honesty and budgeting with a recurring revenue stream. You know, have we uh, collectively missed our mark either by moving revenues into the operating budget, the day in, day out operating budget, and from the town side, um, as I look at the trend from 2009, it's been up, 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 up. So I don't think the town's commitment has, has, is to be questioned in this. This, I, I frankly don't feel, falls squarely on the town. On the contrary, I'm not making any particular accusations, but boy, a $400,000, we got to fix it this year. And then to fix it this year and make it palatable, we cut it down to $200,000, is still a big lift for the town. But that, that piece right there, I, I think, falls squarely on the administration. And I like the administration a lot. And don't take this as, a, as an admonition. I just, you know, just that slow creep is something we have to avoid in the future. So, so with, with that, I, I, I don't know if we're going to cover new ground right now. Um, I, I think we need to talk with the Finance Committee and the Board the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, and the School Committee again. Um, in like next week or two, and we and I don't care if it's a different night during the week. Um, Peter, you want to add something? Um, I just want to say that when we had our last meeting, uh, mm -hmm. we didn't have something to go with. Uh, we had a couple members of the finance committee there, and we also had Scott and David there, and so there was uh, extended conversation about how to move forward with this and about the issues that you've raised. Um, and coming out of that was a suggestion which is being played out in front of you here, which is um, well, first let me say, when you're trying to put together a budget and come up with a bottom line, the question is, what's the right bottom line? Okay, there's a, there's a bottom line that you need to operate the school, but there's also bottom lines that you know, it can be supported under various scenarios, in particular with or without an override, okay? And to a large extent, we, at that point, are guessing at that. So it's like put together a budget that you really don't know how much money you're gonna have to spend. So the, you know, this is not our final budget. We haven't voted on this yet. This is part of a process tonight, okay, to get it out there and visible what the issues are and what the problems are, okay? And I think that's a continuation of what we were doing our last meeting, like I said, with Scott and David there, and you had a lot of useful stuff to say, but one of them was, you need to go to the Fleckman meeting, you need to have it on TV, you have to lay out, okay, what, you know, what various uh, possibilities are. Okay, I think that's been done, and I think that that's progress. I mean, and we've gotten, a number of other people here that have had uh, very constructive suggestions as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, but if you look back, for example, at just the last couple of years where there has been a process of taking an override to the voters, okay, that is a difficult process. It's a difficult process deciding whether to do it. It's a difficult process deciding on how much to do. Okay? It doesn't get done in one evening. Okay, Last year I remember sitting here at Selectman meetings over a period of about four weeks. Mm -hmm. While that slowly developed enough consensus to say, okay, we're going to do this. Okay, If I'd known what I know now about what our school choice situation really was, I would have been here arguing for another 100000 on that override. Okay, But that's history. We can't oh, go back and change it. it. But, and, and that's a good and, point. And it might not have passed if he'd had another 100000 You never know. But I'm just saying that I still, getting back to where we are now, I think we are, we got a process we got to go through to try and figure this out, to try and get support for what we end up doing. Okay, and I think this, is a, this has been a useful evening. Um, whether the next step is we have our own meeting and our own public hearing on the budget for next Wednesday, nine days from now um, and you know you guys and finance so on obviously you know if you're in the room too that's clearly better because we got to keep figuring out I mean you 
the numbers are bad. I mean, there's absolutely no better, you know, no, no uh, denying that. But you still got to do something. Now, if we look, you know, the question about what's coming down the road, okay? I look at this and I say, you know, I could tell you last year we're going to need another teacher this time around, okay? I can look at it and say, not the next time around, but two times from now, we're going to need another teacher because the fourth grade is going to be aging out, okay? So you got that going on. Where are we as far as the school choice number? Okay. The way I see it, we went from having the year in, you know, the year in reserve, okay, to slowly chewing it up. And when you slowly chew it up and you're, you're coming down and you hit suddenly the level point, which is what is sustainable, okay, it's a hard landing, okay? And we have had an extra hard landing because in this year's budget, we thought we had an extra 50 some thousand that we actually ended up with. So it becomes a really hard landing. So that's why these numbers are um, you know, in the, uh, anywhere like the range they are. Okay, if I look at school choice looking forward for a year, the school choice numbers we've got for this year are based on uh, 40, an estimated of 40 kids in school choice in this school, okay? We've been running at, you get the monthly reports, we've been running at about 41 average, okay? Which would indicate very, very roughly because you don't know how much the sped increments will change. But just in terms of the population, we're running roughly, you know, we bottomed out here now at 320. It's not like the next year it's going down to 200, okay? The next year might go down to 300. Okay. It's not going down to 250 or 200, okay, unless we, you know, take an axe to the program, drive people out of town. So that I think that, you know, that situation that we're facing now with the school choice is not one that's going to just keep repeating because we've taken a huge, we're taking a huge hit now. You know, I don't see it continuing. We do have an extra teacher coming along, okay. There will be at that point, assuming we're in the two sections per uh, grade. Uh, this year, assuming we we add one teacher, okay, and we keep the two kindergartens, space gets a little tight, okay. When fourth grade goes, you know, when the fourth grade ages out, and we add another teacher, space will get somewhat tighter because compared to when the school was built, school was built for two classes per grade but it wasn't built for the full-time kindergarten and the pre-K programs that we've got, okay? And it wasn't built for necessarily all the other, you know, arts and stuff like that taking the space they took. So that, you know, some point down the road, space may be a big issue. You know, that may be coming. Um, other than that, we have a capital program that is doing better than it was in terms of keeping up, okay? There's still gonna be stuff goes wrong with the school, but we've done a bunch of stuff in the last year or two, okay, to be fixing stuff that comes up rather than to be putting Band-Aids on it, okay? And I think that's a proper thing. So, you know, I asked the question to Darius uh, when we were talking before the meeting, and I said, what's the budget FY21 look like? Okay, now obviously we haven't put together a budget for FY21. Um, you know, I, I, it can't be anything like this, I can't imagine, unless, you know, we get abandoned by, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, our school choice numbers really go south because we end up cutting a bunch of programs that keeps them here. Okay, so I, I'm just trying to give you a sense of, we came here not with a finished product, mm -hmm. okay, but realizing that the solution has got to be a cooperative understanding between not only these three boards, but the town as a whole not just the school population, but the town as a whole. And how we get to that final number just doesn't get done in one evening. Okay. I think we make progress tonight. There are a bunch more nights, okay, before sometime in about the first week of April, you guys are gonna say, okay, here's the budget we're recommending, okay, and here's whether or not we're having an override, put an override on the ballot, and if we are, what the dollar number is, okay? And then we still don't know until the first week of May, we see how people vote. Right. So if, if the question was from from Darius was, 
what did he learn tonight, right? And I can tell you, um, if unless you can present us a budget of eighty thousand dollars increase, you're probably um, that. That's what it, I mean. Because you're forty percent of our forty percent of the two hundred thousand. So I'm saving around eighty thousand dollars for the elementary school budget. So unless you get to eighty thousand dollars, that that's where I would have to see your budget being. And and, and this is just I'm just talking numbers. I'm not. So if you're not if, if it's not at eighty thousand dollars, the hundred ninety four thousand to me is is uh, is is not obtainable under our present. I, mean, I walked out. I walked out of that meeting we had with you guys there, and I say to myself, "There's no way we're, we're going to avoid having to have an override." Mm. Okay, if we want to keep the school the way the school is. Because I know that the, yeah. you know I know about what the revenues are going to be, and I know that there are all sorts of other claims on those revenues besides just the school. And even if we got 100% of the revenues, yeah. it's not going to do the job. Okay, so then it's a question of how we're going to get there, what the what's the number going to be, and how we're going to get there. And getting to way down the road a successful override is a long and sometimes difficult process. Okay, but. Each one of these meetings, you move it a little further along. Okay, and if we come out of this and all you understand is, well, you come in here with a budget, you know, possible budget that's much more expensive than we can afford, and it doesn't do the job. Okay. Well, that's what I heard so far today. Right, and so it's sort of like, but we were sort of encouraged. Let's go in there and show what happens if we start trying to get it down to something more reasonable. And we had that conversation. We were at, at the same meeting, and I thought that was. That this step was very, very important, right. you know. And I think I think I used the term "warn the public," right? Exactly. Let's let's put it all out there. Elliot, okay. thank you. Uh, I felt that when I left that meeting, one of the most important things that I was looking forward to seeing was an A, B, C, a hmm. multi version, right? Different options. Draft that we could compare. And that, I think, the, the difficulty that I see is coming from that we've only sort of seen two so far, that we've seen a 12%, which is like a left hook from Muhammad Ali, it feels like, or now maybe just a jab, which is at eight. So we need to know what kind of, what our range of punches that we can absorb to continue the metaphor. Okay. Well, you understand, you understand that if you give credence to the discussion in this room about the need for two sections of a kindergarten, then you add 2% to what was presented right. here. Right. That's, you're going from right. 7 to 9. And yep. that's something right. to look at. Correct. So that's another, whether that's another level in your requested level, that's but one. that clearly is one very straightforward. Right. You get, okay. Like so option A, B, and C. I got, I got two whatever. more people. I got Francis and Nathaniel. Then we're going to call it quit because you guys got more stuff to do. But Francis, then Nathaniel. What I want to say is we need to have, like I just said, we need to have this data so we have options to look at. Mm -hmm. And one of those options should be a best case scenario. You know what I mean? If we were running on all cylinders, and everything was perfect as it should be, what would it cost without the money coming from school choice? Because personally, I have never liked the idea of having school choice be part of a budget. I like to look at school choice money as being gravy, something that you use to paint the school paint if you wanted to, or get a new whatever. So part of this for me should be we should have an option that says if everything was perfect, it's going to be. So I, I, I go back to, to the concern about um, if we make too many cuts, it affecting the town. Our town, our entire, the entire income of our town is property taxes. We do not really have a commercial or industrial mm -hmm. business in town. We don't have a revenue stream that are coming in for the property taxes. Um, and if, if our, our school is one of the biggest factors of the town, a lot of people with the 
town before the school, lost people moving to town because school was so good. And if we if we <coughs> reduce the quality of the school, we're both going to uh, reduce property values in town, which directly affects the revenue. And we're also going to reduce the, the drive to have people moving into town, which is also going to affect the revenue. And so, you know, if we make these austerity institutions today, five years from now, ten years from now, it's going to be worse than it is today. If we've been making if we've been making choices five years ago, ten years ago, to increase funding for the school and to get ahead of some of this stuff, uh, we might be in a better position today, and so I worry about what's going to happen going forward. Well, it's funny you mention that because it reminds me of the numbers that we asked about in our first override. Uh, we've, all, we've made these same arguments. This is just another repeat of the same arguments we've made, and we, and we now have data that shows what happens when you make those cuts. And when we go back to what we were looking at, it seems to be kind of like, you know, where we should have been, and we have tried this. And this is why I say there's the challenge. This is, and this kind of dovetails with what you're saying, Peter, this is one step in a long, painful journey. It's never easy, and it shouldn't be. I mean, this, this is hard work. If it was simple, it would be a vastly different world. But, uh, you know, that number, it sounds a lot like what we were looking at before, but making the argument, there's more than just making it academically and knowing that, because then we have to step outside of this room and sell it to everybody else. And that's one of the big challenges. All right, so I guess we'll be seeing one another in the near, near future. Oh, yes. You guys got a meeting next Monday night? No, next Wednesday. It's next Tuesday. Wednesday? Tuesday. Tuesday? That's one of my other questions. It's Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday it is. Six Peter, Sorry. Peter, change your schedule. Change your calendar. <laughs> calendar. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to thank everyone to show up. And, and again, I, and I've said it before, and I'll say it a hundred million times. But it's a conversation that we have to have. It it it's and I think it's good conversation. It and and carry a respectful conversation between all of us. If people agree, disagree. Um, and and I think people want facts; they don't want emotions. And and I think there you, you said it before: there are neighbors, there are friends. And when it's all done, we they're going to be, still be our neighbors; they're still going to be our friends. So, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, we'll keep going with what we have to do. Elliot, you going to go take off? I just wanted to double check that that's Tuesday. Is that yeah, I mean, Tuesday the eleventh? It was Tuesday the eleventh. So that no, was Tuesday. Tuesday. 19th. The 19th. 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 Week from tomorrow. Yeah. Week from tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. You want to re-answer that question about the big seat now? Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, next there, up. Is there more? Can we do the budget stuff next? meeting because I have nothing on the meeting and we could just and that'll give me a chance to really get some numbers put them together right you can work together you thought you're yeah, just gonna this is the first step I have for this nice there you go hey you thought you're just gonna ride off into the sunset yeah <laughs> that horse that horse you're on the iron horse my friend all right so we have the minutes of uh March 4th so move Motion made. Second. The motion made and seconded to accept the minutes of March 4th. All those in favor say uh, aye. 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 Three zero. We have no updates from Selectman or the town administrator right now. No. no. Nothing. No. Just the North Main Street right away easements. Okay. We'll talk about that next yeah. week. Um, appointments of uh, public weighers. Uh, Mr. Move, Clerk. Move to appoint. Public wares for Delta Sand and Gravel, TJ Conroy Jr., Melinda Gibbons, and Jane Kuczynski. Second. I have a motion made and second for the uh, appointment of public wares. All those in favor, please signify by aye. saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, just to let you know, everybody knows the uh, public, for the public good, we do have a, uh, the yes. Frontier baseball is running their basketball Stony tournament and that'll be starting like Thursday night so Thursday night Friday night in Sunderland Deerfield and Whiteley gym if you want to see your local local kids play a good brand of basketball come on down and their games all day Saturday from the I'm sure the women's club will have a uh, and people have uh, bake sales and we have a um, 
they, they all have work raffles, they have wonderful raffles, and Sunday will be the final. So if you're interested, watch your uh, young kid. Actually, seventh, eighth, ninth graders play also. Come on down this uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. These are at the elementary school. At the, yes. well, it's at Sunland Elementary, yeah, all of them, and then yeah. uh, Whiteley and Deerfield for Thursday and Friday. Um, any more new business? I actually have another slate of public uh, public wares. Ah. This, this being from All States Material Group. Yep. Uh, they presented Peter Chimzinski, uh, Dean Cloninger, Harold House, Thomas Kelly, Michael Kroll, Ronald Mayette. Jason Massey, Sean Miner, Michael Moriarty, Richard Payne, Homer Parker, Matt Powers, Eric Remillard, Tim Smith, Joel Thurber, Daniel Thurlow, and Todd Uzdavini. Motion. Motion. No second. Was that his second? I have a motion <laughs> made and second for the uh, additional public wares. A couple more. That was late. Oh, and two added to that slate, Dan Peruse and Andrew Bristol. Right. I thought that was a tag to the other emails. Yes. Motion you. is a uh, or second is amended. So we have a uh, motion made uh, second. and yeah. seconded to uh, appoint wares as read by the clerk. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, we're going to get the, right now we... Um, Pursuant to Master in the Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Paragraph 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, if any open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining and or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares. So the chair does declare. Uh, this is hopefully we're going to finish off what we started last night or last week. Last week. Um, so we're going to need a roll call vote after I say we will be returning to public session to adjourn only. We will not take any further votes or do, conduct any other business. We will just come back to adjourn. Do we have a roll call vote, please? Move to enter. I have a motion made to enter. Second. And seconded. Mr. Bergeron? Aye. Mr. Pierce? Aye. Mr. Feitenkevitz? Aye. Three zero, and we will uh, go downstairs to the selectman's office. Thank you, FCAT. Thanks, FCAT. From the big chair. From the big chair. <laughs>